Good morning, students. I'm Nathan Bean, one of the instructors in the department. Today, we're going to be talking about computer graphics. Since you've been learning Python, I thought it might be interesting to open with a demonstration of that language. I'm going to be using this library written by John Zell for his textbook that simplifies getting started. In order to use this library, we need to make sure that it's in the same directory uh, as where we are going to be working, in this case, my graphics directory. And we can go ahead and launch Python. And to pull that in, we're going to have to use a import statement. So from graphics port star. And now I can uh, create a window. <clears throat> and call it win. So this is a window object. And I'll make that a 300 by 300 uh, pixel window. And that, when I run it, will open up a window that we can now manipulate from our program. For example, I might uh, draw a line. So for I in range, let's say from 0 to 300. plot i over i. And notice we now have a line. It runs from the upper left hand corner down to bottom right corner. This is effectively our x coordinate and our y coordinate. So you might be wondering why is the line running this direction and not this direction? Well, there's an interesting story behind that. Let's move on in our slideshow and talk about Rene Descartes. Now, when you study geometry, you remember probably working with the Cartesian coordinate system. Uh, Rene Descartes is who that is named after. He was a mathematician and a philosopher. He studied many things. He's famous for having said, Cagio ergo sum, or I think, therefore I am. And he is responsible for Cartesian coordinate system that you learned uh, as a young student, where the y-axis increases in the positive upward direction and the x increases as you go to the right, and then uh, decreases to the left and y decreases as you move down. Now that's probably what you're most used to, but in computer graphics, we usually are working in what we call display coordinates, where the origin is in the upper left-hand corner, and the x-axis increases to the right, and the y-axis increases in a downward direction. You might be wondering why this came to be. Well, in order to understand that, we have to look at the cathode ray tube, which is the older technology that we used to use for computer monitors and for television sets. So if you remember ever having a monitor or a TV that had the great big bump coming out of the back, this is why. It was using a cathode ray tube. So this entire device here is a blown glass tube. It is a very large vacuum uh, filled device that is uh, completely void of anything inside to evacuate all the air. And then they plug in this device down here in the bottom, which is a electron gun and it will fire off electrons at a very rapid pace. These electrons fly through the tube and are steered by these electromagnetic coils to strike the back side of the screen and on the back side of that screen there are phosphorus dots and there is a red, a green, and a blue dot for every pixel on the screen. When that electron strikes one of those phosphorus atoms, it temporarily joins that atom, uh, gets that atom into an excited state, and when that atom releases that electron because it can't hold on to it, it also releases a photon, so a light particle that travels out of the screen strikes your eye. And that is exactly how these devices work. Now these were first used for television, and the engineers who designed them needed to be able to stream the television to the television set using an analog signal. So that what they came up with was that each um, 
they would use a wave pattern and they would start with the upper left hand pixel and give its value then the next pixel the next pixel the next pixel the next pixel all the way across the top and they drop down a line and go across another line drop down a line go across another line they call these scan lines and this made sense because uh probably reading order it's the way that we read in this part of the world we start at the upper left hand corner of the page and work our way down once they got to the bottom of a frame they would start over and start scanning across the top now, an interesting thing there means that this uh cathode ray the top line or the line that you draw first is constantly fading and then eventually being replaced but you're only drawing one pixel at a time so that pixel lights momentarily and starts fading and then the scan line comes back around and hits it again if you ever watched an old news broadcast where they had crt monitors in the background you would have noticed a vertical line across the screen that's where the light had actually faded out before it had been redrawn and because that was being captured on another video device you caught that exact moment uh, also makes the screen seem to flicker uh, in when they're recorded. So let's go ahead and do a little bit more with our little Python tool. Uh, but this time I'm going to actually write a program. And the program I'm going to write, I'm going to call it WinPy. So again, I have the import statement. I'm creating my window and I'm going to set some coordinates. So three, negative three, negative three, positive three, positive three. That is changing the nature of that window. So now the viewport of the window is going to be the bottom left hand corner and the top right hand corner is going to be three, three. So I'm going to invert that axis. So this looks more like what we're used to in Cartesian coordinates. And I'll go ahead and do the same plot I did before, but now I'm going to divide the I by uh, 100 and 100 so that this better reflects what we'd expect and finally this win.get mouse waits for us to click on the window so that keeps our window from closing so now if i run this program python run to i here's our line again but now it starts at the lower left hand corner and goes to the right hand corner like we'd expect let's do a little bit more with this let's uh think about drawing a, a different line let's say we want to draw the line x equals y over 2 plus 5. Well, this would be our x, this would be our y. So if we want to make that y over 2 plus 5, we would divide this by 2, multiply that result by 5. Or add, sorry, add 5 to that. And that should, well, 5 will shift us quite a bit. Let's do 2. And we run this again. And notice our line has now shifted upwards by two, and we've uh, tweaked the, the slope of the line. Okay, now let's go ahead and draw a sine wave. So to do this, we are going to again uh, create a set of coordinates. This time let's run from negative 50 to positive 50. So we will say when dot set chords negative 50, negative 50 positive 50, positive 50. So this is the uh, coordinate corresponding to the upper left-hand corner and the coordinate corresponding to the lower right-hand corner. And now we will go ahead and do a range from negative 50 to negative 50. And we will plot the line i and then sine of i and because we're going to use the sine function we need to import the math library and this is one of the core libraries so it doesn't have to be in the same folder it will be found where it is let's go ahead and make that plot have a red line <laughs> it helps go from a negative to a positive not all the same Then we see a nice sine wave extends across. So this graphics library lets us do pretty much the same things that you can do on your graphing calculator and quite a lot more. So if you're curious, uh, we'll share this in the show notes. You can go ahead and download and play with that Python graphics library yourself. 
Now, all computer graphics eventually displayed on screens use pixels, with each pixel composed of a combination of red, white, and blue values. For the CRT monitors, these pixels are created with fo glowing phosphorus dots, while for LCD screens, they are an open or closed liquid crystal gate that allows the monitor's backlight to pass through a color filter. But when we store graphics as a file, we have a choice. We can either store that pixel data as it would appear on the screen, which we call raster graphics, or we could store the instructions on how to draw it, which we call vector graphics. Raster graphics include file formats like JPEGs, bitmaps, GIFs, and PNGs. And vector graphics are primarily represented by SVG files. Raster graphics tend to be a lot larger as they have to store a lot of pixel data. And if you blow them up like this raster graphic on the left, notice the pixelation. That is a common feature of scaling uh, raster graphics to be larger. On the other hand, vectors, when you scroll up their representation, because they store the instructions, you just scale up the instruction and it still looks nice and smooth. A good example of the difference of graphics formats comes from fonts. In the early days of computing, almost all of our fonts were bitmap based, and the raster as the raster data could be quickly copied to the screen. But this raster approach required you to have a different bitmap for every size of the font that you wanted to display. Now uh, that limited the available sizes for your fonts. As computation became more powerful, bitmap fonts were replaced with vector fonts. Most modern computers use true type fonts, which primarily use a vector representation. But what about three dimensional graphics? How do these work? Well, to answer that question, let's turn our attention first to one of the first 3D video games created Wolfenstein 3D, created by id Software. To be able to render in three dimensions, program and game designer John Carmack developed a ray casting approach, which is sometimes called pseudo 3D. An arc of rays was drawn from or cast from the player's perspective to the wall, and they determined how far away that intersection was. Based on that distance, they were able to calculate how high that should be drawn in a vertical swath on the screen. As you can see, these walls back here, as they are farther away, are being drawn as shorter slices. And you would just draw the entire scene from left to right. Each one of these rays corresponded to one vertical slice of the screen. Now, this is not a true 3D representation. As you can see from the model on the right, this is really just a 2D scene projected into 3D. Now, to do 3D truly uh, requires a three-dimensional representation. And nearly all modern 3D graphics use triangle meshes to do this. Why triangles? Because they are composed of only three points in space, that means that they are mathematically guaranteed to be coplanar. That simplifies a lot of the rendering algorithms. A triangle mesh is defined by its vertices. These are 3D points in space, usually in Cartesian coordinates. This shows the vertices of a 3D cube. In addition to the positional data, vertices also often specify color, texture, coordinates, and other values like normal tangent and cotangent, which we use in 3D rendering calculations. In practical work, triangle meshes are almost always created with the aid of 3D modeling software like Maya or the open source Blender. The triangle meshes, the triangles in the triangle mesh are projected onto a 2D raster or a pixel based representation, much like Carmack's ray tracing, except instead of projecting a ray in two dimensions, a ray is cast in three. The ray originates from a focal point where the game's camera is located, passes through the space where a pixel of the screen would be, and then finally strikes objects in the scene. Pixel's final color is determined by the closest object it strikes. And this information can be combined with texture information and lighting calculations to create realistic scenes. The mathematical basis for these calculations is linear algebra, aka matrix math. These are example transformation matrices that are used to rotate, scale, and translate 3D objects quickly. You can learn more about matrix operations in Math 551, Applied Matrix Theory, which is one of your possible math electives. Mathematical operations that create the rendered 3D scene from the graphics data are normally carried out on a specialized graphics hardware, which is optimized for these matrix-based calculations. To make rendered objects look more realistic, many programs utilize programs running on the hardware, which are called shaders, to compute light or shadow interacting with the surface. Modern graphics hardware also is programmable using specialized shader 
programming languages. This allows graphics programmers to create complex programs to simulate reflections and model realistic surfaces with subsurface scatter, emulating light passing into an object and reflecting off interior surfaces. For example, the reason you see blue veins in your skin is that some of the light passes through your skin and bounces off of them. Realistic shaders can mimic this effect. Computer animation is created by transforming the mesh's vertex data prior to rendering. This step is also normally performed by a shader and uses a simplified representation of the model where matrices represent the position and orientation of the bones of a character. These positions can be created by modelers using techniques similar to stop motion video, motion capture from actors, or you can generate them algorithmically. A more realistic method of rendering objects is to bounce rays emitted from a light source around the scene, simulating absorption and reflection until they reach the camera. This approach is more computationally expensive, so it is rarely used in real time, i.e. game applications. However, it is commonly used in the film industries in conjunction with render farms, clusters of graphic workstations that each render a single frame of the movie, which can sometimes take hours. Let's watch a short animated film developed by Pixar. This is Tin Toy. As you probably noticed in the movie, computer graphics can be quite disturbing at times. This problem is known as the Uncanny Valley. This graph was created by robotics professor Mashiro Mori in 1970. The concept was actually studied by Freud in the 1910s. We see here uh, a graph of how human-like a robot is, uh, or how well we feel about that. So, for example, an industrial robot is not very human. A humanoid robot uh, is more human-seeming, as is a stuffed animal. But as they get more and more realistic and more like a human, we start seeing some very uh, disturbing feelings about them, which we call the uncanny valley. So things like prosthetic hands and zombies and corpses really bother us because they are so lifelike but not alive. Uh, and robots that are made too similar, or in this case, computer graphics that are too close to human appearance but aren't quite right can actually be quite disturbing. An alternative to triangle mesh th meshes is representing 3D objects with voxels, volume elements. This is analogous to the 2D raster graphics, while triangle meshes are more like 2D vector graphics. Using this kind of representation for three dimensions consumes a large amount of memory. It leaves us with two choices. The first is to increase the voxel size. This is the technique used by Minecraft, one of the most popular voxel-based games. And the second is to simply add more storage capacity, as is used in medical imaging where CT and MRI scans are often stored and represented using voxels. This, of course, consumes terabytes of data. And that wraps up computer graphics. I hope that you had uh, an enjoyable time and hopefully learned something.